morning and welcome to House Judiciary Committee. And this morning we are going to be looking at S-119, uh, which is a bill that passed the Senate uh, regarding use of force and also considering an amendment uh, that, uh, that Representative Lalonde worked on with, with others. Um, Representative Lalonde will be joining us shortly. He um, had a doctor's appointment, dentist appointment, but he will be here soon. Um, so I'd like to start with Representative Ann Donahue and welcome you, um, Ann, as uh, lead sponsor of, of, of one of the bills that, and, uh, and also as, as a leader in, in, this, in this issue. So thank you. Go ahead. Uh, thank you very much, um, Representative Van Donahue. Um, and I just want to briefly uh, talk about the background and uh, the new language addressing it. The reason I put this proposal on the table is because I thought it was uh, the, the gap in, in our uh, approach is the failure to look up to look at the things that immediately led up to the use of deadly force as part of the assessment of whether it was appropriate. And it seemed to me that this is the issue that we've seen as a problem most often in Vermont. This was not about other states. It's what was happening in Vermont. Um, I think we're all familiar with the UVM case where it would seem that um, the uh, interaction that led to the use of force was instigated or caused by um, the officer. Uh, we see it in the charging with a shovel. There was not a requirement, for instance, to try to hide behind the police car. It was because the force was an immediate threat that made it justified. And one of the less commonly referenced cases, you know, a woman said her husband was left with a gun to commit suicide, pulled over on the interstate. He's standing with it there with a the gun with, to his head and won't put it down, so he's shot and killed. Um, you know, was that the best way to approach and create the interaction um, that put others at therefore at risk and resulted in a, a, what was found to be a justified use of force. And, and I think um, the question of whether um, it might not have been necessary if the right things were done and how that ties to whether it was justified was really well stated by our attorney general in looking at the, the UVM case where, and, and these are direct quotes, they're direct quotes that were in the media, so I'm not vouching directly for them, but that Officer Campbell was reasonable to believe he was in immediate danger of unlawful bodily harm, and his use of such force was necessary to avoid this danger. That's what made the standard that it was reasonable, but his use of foul language and antagonistic behavior did not de-escalate the situation, which ultimately, and I think these are the key words, put him in a position where it was necessary to physically defend himself. He created the situation that made it necessary to defend himself, but because it became necessary, it was justified. And I think that's the really um, key issue that has been my concern. You could take the extreme example I'm not saying this ever happened in Vermont or even would, but the extreme example, what if you goad a person into pulling a gun and then they've pulled the gun because you said, come on, come on, I dare you. You are then justified uh, because you have that immediate threat uh, to life because the gun has been drawn. Um, and I am a little concerned about whether the language on uh, page nine of the side-by-side, -side, which is where I was looking at it, uh, does achieve that because it's not clear to me that the final sentence, which is when feasible an officer shall employ all other reasonable means before resorting to the use of deadly force, not clear whether that um, actually modifies the first sentence because the first sentence says it's considered necessary when given the totality, an objectively reasonable officer would conclude there was no reasonable alternative. Well, at that second in time, when that when Phil Grennan came out with a knife, at that point, there probably was no reasonable alternative. Um, so that still doesn't uh, take us into looking at what were the police actions as a whole um, responsible for provoking the situation, uh, and therefore the the death was not 
justifiable, the use of, use of force in that final moment. Um, so, so that's my only concern. Um, I think that it's clear that the committee is trying to get to the issue that is my greatest concern. Um, I, I'm not sure it gets it there. And one uh, sub comment very, very briefly uh, in skimming the language, because I'm not, I'm not the one who's gone into the depth on all the, the right wording, but, but um, it does appear to, because it brings in a broader use of force policy, not just deadly force, um, the use of other force appears to only be justified if it's crime related, an arrest or a crime has occurred, um, as opposed to the use of deadly force, which is when there's imminent harm to, to anyone and it doesn't have to be tied to a crime, which could suggest that if it's a lower level of threat than a deadly threat, you cannot intervene with any use of force and might put you in a position of having to wait till it's a point of deadly force. I'm not, I'm not sure if that's where we wanna go with that aspect, but as I say, I'm, I'm not sure it just caught my eye looking through. And uh, that's all I wanted to say, unless there were any questions about it. Okay, I do see Barbara's hand before I get to Barbara. Um, Anne, thank you. I, I really appreciate your, your comments. And uh, if you could help us think about um, when you were talking about um, page nine of the side by side, um, mm -hmm. how language that, that could help us. That would tie it. Yeah, make tie sure it. it was tied. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that'd be okay. That'd be great. Thank sure. you. Uh, Barbara. Thank you. Um, so, sorry I missed the very beginning, but I. I'm incredibly sympathetic with what you, um, the issue that you raised and in watching some of the um, former incidents that have happened in Vermont, the goading is a really big worry. And I'm wondering if even at the lower level, um, language needs to be tied in because use of any force, you could certainly uh, try to get under um, somebody's skin. And I feel like we've seen that happen nationally and in Vermont and it's, it's outrageous. So I wonder about even goading as a um, uh, forbidden uh, action or at, at any level that can be punishable because again, it's just leading up to it. Or, or as an action that would um, uh, uh, rebut uh, reasonableness. In right. Effect. Yeah, I think there's a little bit more of a tie in the language right now on other uses of force. Um, okay. It seems to be a little more, but, but maybe not, still not fully. Thanks. Thank you. I'm not seeing any other hands, but I sometimes it takes time to push buttons. I want to make sure nobody else has any questions. Nope. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Really, really appreciate it, Anne. Thank you. I'll try to great. stay and watch briefly. So. Okay, great. So I see our other three witness, witnesses are here. Um, and again, this, this next hour or so is yours. So um, not sure who wants to go go first or whatever, but we do have, I'm just looking, Bo Yang, Wilda White, and uh, Kaya Morris. So however, however you'd like. So then why don't we start with, I'm not seeing anybody raise it. So Wilda, are you prepared to go first? I can't hear you. Cold called back in law school. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> right. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I will go first. Uh, thank okay. you. Uh, my name is Wilda White. I, um, I'm listed on the agenda as the chair of the Mental Health Crisis Response Commission. I chaired the uh, commission during our review of the uh, killing of Phil Grennan at the hands of the uh, Burlington Police Department. I'm also the former executive director of Vermont Psychiatric Survivors. I consider myself a psychiatric survivor um, <clears throat> because I uh, uh, survived psychiatric abuse. 
Uh, and I'm also an attorney licensed to practice in New York, California and Massachusetts. Um, and I bring all that to bear in my uh, testimony here today. Um, again, I wanna thank you for the opportunity to testify. I know when I first moved to Vermont, um, it was almost impossible to get an invitation to testify uh, before the uh, 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 legislature uh, when I was executive director of Vermont Psychiatric Survivors. Um, <clears throat> and um, uh, I think just because of general discrimination against people with psychiatric histories. And so um, I, I really do appreciate it. And I think uh, other people should be also given the opportunity uh, the same opportunity that I've been given, uh, particularly those who uh, are traditionally excluded from this, um, this, this forum and this venue. Um, I also want to thank the, 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 this, this committee. Um, I think that the, uh, the Senate Bill 119, um, uh, the proposed amendment, uh, represents a dramatic improvement uh, in this bill. And, and I appreciate your, your efforts in that regard. I appreciate the expansion of the bill to cover uh, general use of force and not only just deadly use of force. I think that's a, a, an improvement. I also appreciate the attempt to define key terms used in the bill, particularly proportional, proportional and uh, deadly force. And I also appreciate the repeal of Vermont's antiquated uh, justifiable homicide statute. Um, as it stood, uh, as long as you had a deadly force uh, bill alongside your antiquated um, ho justifiable homicide statute, it was really null and void because the um, justifiable homicide statute was much more liberal uh, in what was justified and, and, and really was in direct conflict with the, um, with the proposed statute. As I read the bill, it appears to be really a codification of the US Supreme Court's uh, jurisprudence on, on use of force, um, particularly the use of um, force that's not deadly force. And then it seems to also limit, go a step further than uh, Supreme Court jurisprudence when it comes to deadly force, because it seems to limit uh, deadly force to uh, situations of last resort which I think is actually a, another step in the right direction. I think my, uh, where I think the bill's sh shortcoming is because it misses an opportunity to address um, the deaths of people in mental health crises at the hands of law enforcement, um, which according to CounterPoint, which is the newspaper Vermont Psychiatric Survivor has increased many fold since the death of Phil Brennan. I think five people have been killed in the, four years between um, Phil's death and, and, um, and the present. Um, and so what, what I'd like to do is basically just, I'll just go through uh, kind of step-by-step step some of the, uh, the things kind of both little and larger um, that I would like to see addressed. Um, beginning with kind of the definitions. Um, I think the, the bill could benefit from actually a definition of the word force. Um, it seems, you know, you, you define deadly force, but you don't define force. I know that many police departments, for example, Bur Burlington Police Department and its policy directives do define force. Um, you know, kind of colloquially force is, you know, kind of any kind of physical restraint that has a, a risk of injury. Um, and so I think, I think the bill would be enhanced by a definition of force. Um, prohibited restraint. Uh, this is, this is actually, you know, the, this is a pet peeve of mine when legislators um, name something, but do the, do the exact opposite in the text of the bill. I mean, the best example is the Affordable Care Act, which is not affordable whatsoever. Uh, and here we have prohibited restraint, which is also not prohibited. Um, and it's also, um, when you read the statute, um, it says that prohibited restraints are permitted uh, as kind of in self-defense. So, uh, but in that case, if you're using this quote, prohibited restraint in self-defense, it's not a restraint, it's deadly force. And so the use of the word prohibited 
restraint creates a lot of, I think, confusion. And I, you know, used to be a trial lawyer and I've talked to a lot of juries and these are the kinds of things that juries get hung up on. So say a jury, a, a, a police officer, law enforcement officer is on trial um, for killing somebody in the line of duty. He uses the justifiable homicide defense um, to justify his use of this so-called prohibited restraint. The jury instruction is going to go to the jury and it's going to say, um, was this police officer's use of prohibited restraint justified? And you'll get these jurors who will be so perplexed because they'll say, well, of course it's not justified, it's prohibited. Um, so you create this unnecessary confusion by using the word prohibited restraint to refer to something that's not really prohibited. And so I suggest that the, this body change that terminology um, to more accurately reflect what it is um, you're doing in the body of the, uh, of the text. And I know that means that it'll have to be changed in other areas of the law, but I think it's worth it um, both uh, for clarity's sake, for better drafting and uh, and I think it's also more fair to a police officer. Um, also, I think the prohibited restraint, the way it's drafted, it, um, it's not clear to me what it is you're trying to do. Um, I know that some jurisdictions who have prohibited choke holes or strangle holes, which are two different things, right? So strangle holes, one cuts off kind of breathing, one cuts off blood. And they really only wanted to limit it to strangleholds and, um, and to chokeholds they want. But what, what you're doing, what you, you give the example of saying, you can't touch these parts of the body, but then you make it broader to say, you can't really cut off breathing and blood flow. Um, and so it seems to me that um, you have to kind of do one or two things. It's either you, you want to prevent cutting off breathing and blood flow, which in, which in that case, you wouldn't limit it to touching certain parts of the body. You would say you can't put pressure on the body, um, including the neck, you know, the carotid artery, blah, 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 to prevent breathing or cut, cutting off blood flow. Or you just say you can't put pressure on these parts of the body, right? I don't think you can do both because it's, it's just too confusing. Um, so, so I, I think that section needs some work. Um, and then, and then um, under totality of the circumstances, your definition, I'm switching now to your definition of totality of the circumstances. And I don't have the side by side. I, also, I only have the, uh, the draft that's on the website, the eight pages. But under the definition of totality of circumstances, um, you, you say that uh, totality of the circumstances means all facts known to the law enforcement officer at the time, including the words and conduct of the subject and the conduct and decisions of the officer leading up to the use of deadly force. Now, I think that deadly should be deleted because the, the totality of the circumstances definition applies now both to non-deadly force and deadly force. That was probably carried over when this bill only applied to deadly force. Do you see what I'm talking about? Uh, but anyway, I think that I think that word needs to be deleted. Just and then um, I have a problem, a, a big problem actually, with um, some of the um, the considerations of the totality of the circumstances where where you say that um, consideration of the totality of the circumstances may include under B, subdivision B, little Roman numeral two, signs that the subject is suffering the effects of a mental disease or defect. Now, um, that seems really kind of also antiquated language and pejorative as far as I'm concerned, and also not really reflective of what a police officer is going to encounter uh, in the field, so to speak. Um, you know, people may be, appear to be in the throes of a mental health crisis for a variety of reasons, including a chronic mental health condition, a medication-induced reaction, a diabetic emergency, a traumatic brain injury, 
all of these things can masquerade as um, a, uh, a mental health crisis. And it, it should not be limited to, and officers shouldn't be expected to determine whether something is a defect or a disease, whatever that is. Uh, so both because it's kind of pejorative, dated, um, and because um, it really doesn't, it's not, it, it really doesn't reflect what's happening in the field. I think that language needs to be updated because I think what's really at issue is, is the person impaired physically or mentally such that they are unable with through no fault of their own to comply with an officer's request. Um, I also think this is, and, and, and I'm just gonna segue here into what I think is the biggest missed opportunity in this bill. And that is to specifically address law enforcement encounters with people in a mental health crisis. You know, currently the law is unsettled in the Supreme Court about what officers have to do um, when encountering person who, who's, who is obviously in a mental health crisis. But the circuit courts have been, uh, there's many circuit courts, including I think our second circuit, which have, who have said that the same amount, the same considerations that you use in determining whether to use force or deadly, use force, I'm gonna say use force, when someone's not, when someone is mentally impaired, they're different, right? You don't, some circuits have said, you need to, the, the considerations whether to use force when a person is impaired mentally or physically is different when a person is suspected of committing a crime. Um, and I think that this statute needs to incorporate um, the state of that case law in our circuit. And so where you say in here that the, total, the consideration of the totality of circumstances may include, I'm not sure that that is an accurate statement of the law in the, in the, in the, circuit, in the second circuit. Because I think some circuits say it must include when it comes to people who are in a mental health crisis, who are not suspected of committing a crime, who are not posing a danger to the officer, the, the reasonableness of your actions are different, must be different than if a person is suspected of committing a crime. And that is the problem. That is my main problem with what happened in the case of Phil Grennan. Phil Grennan had committed no crime, was suspected of committing no crime, um, and they treated him like a criminal. Um, and in violation of, I think, constitutional principles and in violation of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, and so I don't wanna get into, I don't wanna discuss the law, but I just wanna tease the issue up for you that I do think that, you know, it would be worth talking with your legislative council to figure out what is the state of the law as applies to people who are in a mental health crisis, um, particularly when, the, when it's not an issue of the use of deadly force and to make sure that this statute accurately um, codifies uh, the state of the law or where we want officers to be in this state. Um, and then I guess, and, and, and the last thing I'd have to say about it is that, you know, like I said at the outset that I'm pleased that the justifiable homicide um, the statute has been repealed because it was antiquated and it didn't really apply. But I do think that the statute would benefit by an explicit um, justifiable homicide statute, um, similar to what California did. And so California had a homo justifiable homicide statute similar to Vermont's, um, just as antiquated. And um, when it changed its um, use of deadly force policy, it repealed it and replaced it with language that specifically said, um, homicide is justifiable when committed by a, they use peace officer, but I'll say law enforcement officer, when the homicide results from a law enforcement officer's use of force that is, compli that is in compliance with you know, this new statute, in this case, section uh, 20 VSA, section 2368. I think that um, it's, I think it's important to be really clear um, that we do have a justifiable homicide statute and that statute applies when you comply with this use of force um, statute. Um, so I will I will stop there to see if there are any um, any questions. Great, thank you so much. I, I 
really appreciate your your testimony and I've been writing really quickly trying to try all this down and I'm so appreciative that we have YouTube so we can go back and and watch the uh, watch your testimony because you really did give us um, a lot of very helpful insight and information. Uh, um, again, I'm not seeing hands, but I want to give folks time to press buttons or jump in. Uh, Martin, there you go. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Wilda, for your testimony, and, and actually was very helpful. Uh, the input that you gave in the Senate uh, Judiciary Committee, I read have read over your uh, submitted testimony there, and also the testimony you are. It's not wasn't testimony, but uh, your discussion at the Social Equity Caucus was also very helpful. And I tried, uh, as as a person who worked on this amendment, I tried to incorporate uh, various ideas that that you had brought up in those two places. And uh, it sounds like I may have gotten some of them, but not not necessarily all of them. But this is an iterative process. This is an iterative process, certainly. And I'm just wondering if. Um, if you uh, have any specific language related uh, to particularly uh, how to treat law enforcement encounters with mental health crises, if you've seen that before, or, or if not, because I would certainly like to explore that. And, and I didn't catch all of uh, Representative Donahue's uh, testimony. I was driving back from the dentist at the time, but uh, I think I caught quite a bit of it. But I'm wondering if, if you'd be willing if, uh, if uh, I could perhaps work with you and, and with our legislative council uh, on that, because uh, normally I wouldn't ask that kind of question, but, but we're really on a very tight time frame. And I think I would love to see us get this thing through uh, because we, we have some, uh, it's certainly salient, we certainly have some wind in our sails, so to speak. Uh, and, and certainly would like to try to, to improve this as you've explained. So I guess there wasn't really a question there so much as a request that maybe I'll touch base with you uh, later if you're, if you're uh, able and willing. And I think I, you're I think I'm willing and just let me, I mean, it may just be something as simple as, um, this is kind of uncharted waters. It may be something as simple as quoting from, let me, let me read you just a sentence from um, the uh, Ninth Circuit Court of Appeal where they said, quote, the level of force that is constitutionally permissible in dealing with a mentally ill person differs both in degree and in kind from the use of force that would be justified against a person who has committed a crime or who poses a threat to the community. I mean, something as simple as that may suffice, you know, just lift, lifting the language directly from a case to let people know you, you, I'm looking at you and you're looking puzzled. I'm not sure. Do you have no, a no, that sound, no, that sounds good. I mean, what, what's the case site? Um, do you want, I can send you, I've written this out. Do you want me to send it to you? Oh, well, that would it's be not, helpful. It's, not, it's Gray versus Cummings, 917, Fed Third, one, and it's a, the First Circuit Court, First Circuit 219. There's Great. a really recent um, uh, Second Circuit Court that just came out in May 2020 with the egregious facts, almost similar to the Grinning case um, that I would uh, ask you to look at. And it's, 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 it's on a motion to dismiss, so it has those limitations, but I think it gives you an idea of the direction that the Second Circuit is going. Um, it's a case where they actually denied to um, dismiss the case and hold that the qualified immunity held. Police went into an African American, 68 year old African American male's house who had um, a history of mental illness um, because he had inadvertently triggered his life alert button. And when they got there, they were told it was inadvertent, he didn't need help. Um, and they busted in anyway with tactical and killed him. Um, the trial court dismissed it. The Second Circuit said, no, hold up. Um, so it's a really good case to look at. And that case is Chamberlain um, versus, uh, God, I can't remember that. I'm drawing a blank. But Oh, Chamberlain versus City of White Plains. Um, and I'll get you the, but I think those are really two good cases to look at. And I'll get you the um, citations. Great. I appreciate that. You're welcome. Great, excellent, thank you. Uh, let's see. Um, 
So I see Selena, Barbara, and Coach. I'm sorry if I'm calling you out of order when you put your hands up, but Selena. Press, pressing all my buttons to prepare to speak. Um, thank you so much for your testimony. It, this was so, so helpful. And um, I had been um, starting to wonder about that language of May in the totality of the circumstances um, sections, you know, that it may include these. And I think I'm hearing you say that, sorry, I can get, um, can get exactly into a section that I'm talking about. So I'm talking about subsection um, A5 of section one, it says, considerations of the totality of circumstances may include, I think one of the things I'm hearing you say, and I just wanna make sure I'm hearing it correctly, is that really more appropriate language might be shall include these Actually, factors. Actually, I'm not saying that in terms of all of the listings. I'm only saying that in terms of um, okay. people who are in a mental health crisis uh, who have committed no crime and I think, I think it's an accurate statement of the law to say may in those other cases, right? Because in um, uh, Graham versus Connor, that's what the court said, the US Supreme Court said in 1989 case where they laid out the objective, um, reasonable objective standard in deadly force, it said it may include, that's an accurate statement of the law, except when it comes to people uh, in a mental health crisis, um, some of the circuits are saying shall, right? It's, it's a different standard. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm proposing that you tease out the, 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 the stuff that has to do with people who are in a mental health crisis, who've committed no crime, who you're there for either kind of welfare checks or the emergency aid exception to the um, warrant requirement, those cases. And those are a lot of, those are the many of the cases where people in, and mental health crises are getting killed when people are coming to their aid, right? Mm -hmm. uh, those are the cases where you, you may need a shall rather than a may to accurately reflect the direction of the law. Okay, that, that's so helpful. I really appreciate that clarification. I mean, I do, I do wonder for us in the committee if we could look well, anyway, the, I'll, wait, I'll hold off for committee discussion on on just the sort of some of those other factors and whether there's ways we could be a little stronger or more prescriptive there. But it sounds like there's some case law analysis that might um, prevent us from doing that. But so thank you for your testimony. It was so helpful and so detailed and so um, so useful. I really appreciate it. Thank you. You're welcome. Great. Okay, so we have Barbara, Coach, and then Martin. Um, thank you, Wilda. I, I'm going to echo everyone else's comments. This is like really um, exactly the kind of feedback and input that can make a huge difference in this bill. So I have a couple of questions. I think you raised a great point about impairment. Um, rather than the language which I missed. And it's embarrassing that we're talking about um, uh, a mental health defect. That's horrible, so thank you. So the impairment piece, I do, I do think that we have people constantly um, giving people diagnoses that have no training or reason to be able to do that. And, as you said, it could be diabetes, it could be a number of things. Um, so that does seem really important. I'm also thinking about what um, Representative Donahue said about provocation and wondering about in particular, um, not permitting provocation in situations where somebody is for whatever reason, impaired or in crisis and less able to not take the bait um, and wondered if you had thoughts about how that could um, be addressed. I 
I mean, I, I just feel like everybody should know that goading is so wrong. <laughs> you know, that um, it, it hardly needs to be written into a statute. And I think what, um, what, what, what Representative Donahue was talking about was really about uh, kind of, you know, after the fact, holding someone accountable, right? Coming, right? And saying, no, this, that wasn't justified because you goaded. You know, my orientation has always been more like deterrence because, you know, I'm not really interested in having my family have a wrongful death lawsuit, you know, right. <laughs> for me, right? You know, I want to be alive, right? You know, I don't yeah. want to, I don't, I don't want my legacy to be a, a multi-million dollar, you know, recovery for my heirs. Um, and so my, my orientation is how can we write a statute that deters rather right. than just, you know, you know, hold, hold someone liable after the fact. Um, and um, I, I, I really feel like, uh, yeah, I, I really don't know if that's really required in the law. I think everybody knows that you shouldn't you shouldn't be goading people into, um, you know, shooting somebody or killing killing somebody. But I think what happens is, and this is this is a problem because in the in the case of people who are in a mental health crisis, with with such poorly trained um, officers and, and and with such oppressive and because people in, in with with you know, presumed psychiatric histories are so discriminated against in this country and so oppressed, and that oppression is so in, is so normalized right. that almost anything an officer does is probably going to um, uh, be the wrong thing. So, for example, in the case of, of Phil Grennan, um, the officers came into his apartment, you know, loud voices they were they were like within earshot discussing what they were going to do to him right they were saying we're going to tase the shit out of him we're going to put his ass on the ground we're going to do blah 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 now all of this to a man who thought he was um i don't know if you all know but phil grennan actually predicted that the police officers were going to come to his house and kill him he called up his therapist like a week to 10 days before and said, I fear that the police are going to come to my house and kill me. And I'm going to protect myself with knives if they come. They came to his apartment. He protected himself with knives. He was afraid of them. He was hiding in his bathtub. Right. Um, right. He was afraid of them. And so they come into his apartment, um, you know, after three or four hours and say, all these things within earshot um, of all the things they're going to do to him. Well, in his mind, that is, they are provoking him, right? You know, they, but, but the police officers wouldn't see it that way. You know, they don't see that as goading, but they were doing so many of the wrong things that all of those things pre precipitated his, you know, right before they shot him, they said they were going to, you know, you know, light him up. Right. You know, but but doesn't it seem, because I'm with you about the deterrent, I, and I know it seems like the police don't eat the daisies law, but we have seen having watched the, the fellow who ended up dying up at the hospital in the, I mean, we need to define, I think we need to define what is goading or provoking. And maybe it includes making, uh, harmful comments of what is going to take place in your like maybe it needs to be spelled out it seems ridiculous but on the other hand don't what's the harm in us defining provoke i, I mean i i don't know i don't know if there's a harm i don't even know if it would ever be um well i mean we're living in a time when police officers feel under attack. We're living in a time when police officers feel that uh, they can't do anything right. Um, and we, but we're also living in a time when the U.S. Supreme Court wants to give you know police officers the utmost deference and you know think think that they have so much to do that we don't want to overburden them. 
I sat on a committee that was largely on a commission that was largely, um, you know, filled with, with law enforcement. And what I heard from them was it's too much, right? It's too much. We can't learn all this stuff that you're telling us to do. We, it, it's, it, it's too much training. There's too many directives. There's just too much. There's too much, too much. And so, I mean, that's the harm really is probably alienating law enforcement. And I don't really think you can prescribe all the things that are goading or, or what I'm tr trying to say by my example, law enforcement officers are actually taught to do things in training that are the wrong thing to do when dealing with someone in a mental health crisis. There is no right. way to enumerate all of those things. The best thing to do is to train them. To, you know, that law enforcement officers needed to know in Phil Grinnan's case that people in psychosis actually have pretty acute hearing. We can hear things at sub threshold levels. And so when you're talking five, 10 feet from us, we can hear you saying that you're gonna light us up, that you're gonna tase the shit out of us, that you're gonna put our ass on the ground, that you're gonna, you know, we can hear that and that's not going to be helpful. But I don't think that you can anticipate all the things that a law enforcement officer could do to worsen the situation in dealing with a person in mental health crisis. I think the solution is through training and not through legislation. Okay. Just one last question. A part of it too is, is through attitude, right? We can train all we want, but if somebody has a very strong bias against people with mental health, um, diagnoses, challenges, the training may or may not make a difference. It, it, and yeah, and that, right, and that's what I concluded in, in you know, the part of the Grinnan report I wrote that, that the really root cause of it was a, 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 a bias, an implicit bias against people with mental health challenges. Um, that, was, that was the root cause of it. But, you know, the police are not alone. I mean, the whole society has biases against, with, you know, against people with mental health challenges. Um, you know, the police are no worse and no better than the rest of us. Um, they just have, you know, more lethal means to, uh, you know, kind of express their biases. So um, I, I, I'm not, I mean, I, I, don't, I, I don't feel like it's practical or even advantageous to try to craft a piece of legislation that lists ways that police officers can antagonize and make situations worse. I think that um, uh, police officers know they're not supposed to be making situations worse. I think that when police officers do, I think their egos get the better of them when they do. Um, and um, it has to be, I think, realistically, I think the solution is better training, better recruitment. Um, so that's kind of where I, I, I fall on that. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh... Okay, Coach Martin and then Selena. Wilda, thank you as always. Great to see you this morning. Um, I, I just wanted to offer uh, a, an additional case um, uh, that occurred locally, you know, here in Vermont uh, that takes into account not only a disability awareness uh, component but also the racial aspect. Uh, I was just reading the, uh, 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 the case and basically, you know, I'm familiar with it, but I, I wanted to refer back to, it's the Burwell uh, versus Hartford police uh, case. And uh, this uh, uh, black man was sitting uh, on his toilet at home. Uh, the cleaning lady uh, came uh, to do uh, cleaning of the condo. She didn't know who it was, uh, called the police. The police came and armed themselves with assault rifles, approached uh, the, uh, the gentleman, come to find out he was in a, a diabetic coma. So how is that person gonna respond to an officer's request, as Wil Wilda spoke, you know, earlier, when they're in a physical disorder, and you know, not knowing uh, all of the other uh, components, 
is this as a house? <laughs> you know, simple things like that. Um, so I, I support um, the contention that we need to clarify. Uh, I also know for fact that training, you know, has only, let's say, a portion you know, of the process. It goes back to what Nader had said to us, uh, Representative Hashim, when asked if you had one thing that you could do uh, to help in this process, it's the selection process of the officers, um, because that's where the rubber hits the road. You know, you can do all the training you want, but if the person is predisposed uh, to, uh, to approach situations uh, aggressively, um, you're not going to get to where we want to get to, you know, as far as uh, uh, a change in the policing uh, process. Uh, going back again to the Burwell case, when you look at the language that was used by the officers when they approached him, you know, they used language I will not repeat in you know in public because it it's uh, <laughs> i'm sorry I, I but that behavior in itself is unacceptable you know and so uh that too goes to what uh, uh miss white was talking about with regard to you know we can't train that you know in or out um you know that is a human being characteristic and and that's something that um, you know we can do on the front end so i just needed to share that and thank you again well to uh you know it, it it's like a you know it's like coming to school and you know every time that you testify and uh and it's very enjoyable thank you yes i i i echo echo that it's it's the the uh, memorable and happy law school days <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, okay, so Martin and Salida. Yeah, I just have a quick clarification and then, then one request. Um, so as far as having the separate um, must include total circumstances in the situation where there's a mental health crisis, I want to confirm that that, that would exclude individuals who have committed a crime. I guess I didn't understand the rationale why we wouldn't have that generally if there's a mental health crisis, whether there was a crime there or not. And you are you are uh, muted if you. Yeah, you're asking a really good question. Um, this is a lot like law school. So what the um, what the courts have said is, um, I, I think if um, if the person it doesn't matter if they've committed a crime. I think where the courts have said, like, if you are posing an imminent risk of danger to the police and the public, and and you have a mental, um, you know, health condition, you know, obviously, uh, the police officers would be within their rights using, you know, deadly force, right? So they, they so so some cir circuits stop short of saying there's a whole different. Um, consideration if you have a, a, a mental illness. So that's why I separated out those cases where um, the person is obviously in a mental health crisis but has committed no crime because the courts are really clear there. There's a different standard of how you, when you use force, right? But if the person is actually endangering the lives of the officer or someone else, then the officer um, you know, doesn't have to really use a different standard um, under the law. Now, that doesn't, under, under current law, right? Um, they, can, they can act. And I think the courts mean like if it's imminent, right? It doesn't mean like in the case of Phil Grennan when he's in his house for five hours or four hours, right? You have time to deescalate, you have time to do things. They mean like in the split second moment, person you know, you know can't comply, they have a mental illness, but they're, they're threatening you in the moment then you have the right to use deadly force using the same objective reasonable standard as you would if they didn't have a mental illness. In all other cases, there is, the, the, some circuits say there is a different standard. Is, is that clear? No, it, it, it does. And I guess it, um, 
the, the good thing about being in the legislature is we can go beyond what the courts have done. And if it makes sense that if it's a mental health crisis that is not causing imminent uh, threat of death or serious bodily harm, then, then we should treat whether the person has just um, tried to pass a $20 uh, you know, counterfeit bill or you know, maybe that's a little too close yeah, using think... that exa example, that if there's a mental health crisis, you, you got to treat it differently. I don't care if there's a, particularly if there's a misdemeanor, but you know, I don't no, even I know if I want to agree with you there, Representative Lalonde. I think they would say if it's not an imminent risk to death uh, of, you know, to the officer or others, then you do have to use that kind of different um, right. reason. No, I think that's great. The one, the request I have is uh, I've tried to find, but for some reason haven't been able to. Maybe I'm not looking right for the report the, on the Brennan situation. And if you have that at your fingertips, that you could email it to the committee, that would be very helpful. All right, I will do that. Thank you. So I, I should create my to-do list because I promised to do two things, right? I don't mean to be giving you to-do list. I apologize, but this is just like law school: a Brennan report and then the uh, the case law that deals with um, the mental health crises. Okay. I will do that. Great, thank you. Okay, so uh, Selena and then Coach. Um, I think this might be more uh, this might this might be um, more pointing to discussion for another another day really at the end of the day but I um, really share your observation Wilda that um, the some of the formal de-escalation training that police get actually really seems to escalate a situation and thinking back I was actually a city councilor um, when Phil Grennan was shot and did some work at the local level to institute kind of a review beyond what the state's attorney could do at the time of that. And I, that I think then your work has been so important to, to really <laughs> review that in a meaningful way. But I remember having conversations with our police chief at the time where he said, we did everything we were supposed to do. We used state-of-the-art de-escalation training. And, and one of the examples he gave was like, before we even entered his apartment, we drilled holes in his walls for hours. <laughs> like, just as someone who has worked with people in mental health crisis and just common sense would tell us like, how is that a de-escalation? um tactic in that situation and but yet i i do believe that they were that to some degree at least they were following training that they had received like at the at the state and federal level about how to do this and so i i wonder if to get at representative donahue's concerns about that and to your point that this use of force policy is perhaps not the place to really mandate what goading looks like that we could one path for us through a legislative lens could be to really look at what kind of de-escalation de training um, police are getting in our state and make sure that that truly aligns with best practice um, and not necessarily best practice as just defined by the institution of policing. Well, you know, it's interesting that you, you, that's an interesting question or observation because in this case of the city of Burlington, what I found in, uh, was that Burlington actually has a pretty good policy for dealing with people in mental health crises. They just don't follow it. So uh, the, uh, you know, the commission came up, kind of collectively came up with a list of recommendations about what would have prevented um, Mr. Grennan's death. And then I looked at it and I was like, well, everything you've written down here or we've written down here, Burlington already has in its policies. They just didn't follow it. Um, and so I think that's another reason why I concluded that their own kind of implicit biases um, played a bigger role, played the biggest role in, in his death because they were just kind of cavalier. Um, like when he told you that, you know, 
drilling holes, multiple holes because they kept missing, right? So they would they would drill a hole and end up in a closet. They would drill a hole and end up in a, you know, somewhere they couldn't see anything. Um, and they didn't understand that sound to a person in psychosis, which he was, um, can is really, really aggravating. I mean, that's why he like he began in like his living room, and by the time that they ended, he was in his bathtub, which is farthest away from um, you know the front door with you know the door closed, and they were also incapable of even. Um, I think even because of their implicit biases, they were so incapable of recognizing the signals he was sending. So when they first arrived and they opened the door, uh, you know, using a key, and uh, he closed it, right? He de-escalated it, but they couldn't read that. They read that as aggression. They didn't read that as de-escalation. I'm afraid, right? They find him hiding in his bathtub and still they're reading that as aggression because they have this implicit bias that people who have mental illnesses are dangerous, right? Um, he's standing in the bathtub holding the knives and you know it, the sergeant saw him standing in the bathtub holding the knives. He comes back out to report to Del Pozo. He's standing in the bathtub holding the knives and Del Pozo says, well, is he brandishing them? He goes, no, they're just at his side. So he's expecting aggression, but he's, hearing non-aggression, but they cannot compute because they cannot compute non-aggression because of their implicit bias that people who are in mental health crisis are dangerous. Even before they enter the apartment, Phil Brennan hasn't done anything, hasn't hurt anybody. Before they enter the apartment, the sergeant tells the officers, you know, if he's standing by the door, we're going to put him on his ass, right? He hasn't done anything. He's a 78-year-old, 76-year-old man who's terrified, you know, he has a sign on his door saying, please don't come in here. But they can't read any of the signs because of implicit biases. And so, I mean, the point is, no matter what the policies are, your implicit biases, particularly when you are under stress, will trump everything. Um, and I mean, that's what happened in this case. He did every, Phil Grennan did everything to try to save his life. I mean, they stood within inches of him and told, you know, as soon as I see him, you know, I'll hit him with this, what looked like a gun. And so when Phil came charging out of the bathroom, he thought he was acting in self-defense, which he said he was going to do. Um, and the police did not, you know, they didn't do anything to, um, to accommodate his mental illness, which the Americans with Disabilities Act requires. That's another thing you should understand when you're writing this law. The Americans Disabilities Act does, require, does apply to you know, the arrest and detention of people uh, in, in, you know, in, in a mental health crisis or, or, or with a mental illness. Um, and they didn't do anything. And this was like the second time in a few years that it happened. The same thing happened in the uh, Burnett case. They didn't do anything. They knew, the person, they knew going out, the person had a mental illness. They go out, they do nothing to accommodate it, and they end up killing it even though they had the same policies on, you know, they had the policy to wait, use time as your advantage. They had the policy to take time to get the necessary equipment to protect people. They didn't do it. They had the policy to set up a command post with outside the site, you know, and hearing of the person, they didn't do it. They had a, they had a, they had a policy not to use a taser without consulting with a, a, a mental health worker if the person had a known mental illness. They didn't do it, even though one was on site. Um, they had a policy of, of um, consulting with the crisis negotiators before stopping crisis negotiators. So you, need, you needed to get the approval of the crisis negotiators before you stopped crisis negotiations. They didn't do it. The crisis negotiators were preparing another um, uh, way to reach Phil Grennan when they were told by Del Pozo that they had already decided to make entry. And by the time the crisis negotiator came down to the apartment, they were already in the apartment. The crisis negotiators never told Phil Grennan why they were there. They never tried to engage him and open any questions. Um, when the two initial officers first arrived, one threatened to shoot Phil Grennan. Um, so, I mean, this is what I, I wanna go to these 
I want to, I, I'm spending the time to go through these specific examples because I'm trying to impress upon you how an absolutely great policy will not get applied, um, you know, when these, this implicit bias, right? These, this, these things that we're just not aware of are, are, are operating. And that's what needs to be addressed. And Burlington doesn't feel like they have any implicit biases. And so they will never get addressed, you know, absent some, um, maybe some, some, le some, some legislative uh, move on your part to uh, compel them to look more inwardly at uh, what they're doing. So. Your point is very well taken, thank you. Great, um, Coach, before I get to you, I'm just I'm looking at a time check and um, I'd, I'd like to keep going and, and not, not break this uh, flow. And um, I do know that, um, that uh, Boryang is available um, past 1030 and I'm hoping that Kaya will be as well, but this is, this is really helpful and I think it's important for us to, to take the time. Uh, Coach. Uh, I'll be very quick. Uh, I just wanted to uh... Uh, share uh, the citation, but I'll, I'll put it in the uh, uh, in the chat. Well, actually, I'll email it uh, to the committee members, uh, and that's the Burwell case, uh, because it was settled uh, uh, civilly on his behalf. Uh, the uh, uh, race uh, discrimination component uh, was dismissed, but there again. Uh, the fact that he was going through a physical um, uh, episode at the time and was physically beaten, tased, and uh, maced while sitting on, on the toilet because he didn't respond, because he couldn't respond, is another example of that implicit bias overriding all of the training. And, and so, uh, I did want to make sure that uh, we had another uh, instance of uh, the effect on disabilities and the bias. I think you raise a point, if I may, I'll just briefly respond to, because one of the things I haven't talked about here that is worth mentioning is that um, when a person has a psychiatric history or is a mental health crisis and is also a member of a of, say it's black, the, uh, it, the risk of death is exponentially compounded um, because I'll give you a personal example. One, many years ago, I was standing on the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco in the middle of the night and two officers came up to approach me um, and they had received a call that someone was gonna jump off the bridge. They came up to me and they asked me what I was doing on the bridge. And I said, I was just ha taking a walk. And they go in the middle of the night and I was like, yep, I'm just taking a walk. And uh, they go, well, you're on the wrong side of the bridge. <laughs> you're like, this bridge is designed so you can't get to this side of the bridge. How did you get to the side of the bridge? I said, I don't know, I'm just taking a walk. And so they were concerned. They said, so one officer said, well, are you planning to kill yourself? And I said, no. And the other officer said, of course she's not going to kill herself. She's a black woman. Black women don't kill themselves. Um, and so they uh, just let me go. But before they let me go, they asked me if I would show them how I got on the bridge so they could protect people who were going to kill themselves. Um, I have seen time and time again that police officers use their um, these kinds of biases Black women don't kill themselves. Black people aren't mentally ill. Black people can act right, but not, you know, you know, maybe not in front of white people. Or I think, in, in my opinion, the Sandra Bland case is an example of police officers not giving a damn about whether she was going to kill herself or not thinking she was suicidal because she was black. Um, and so, and if you're a black man, they're more afraid of you. Um, uh, or they think you're pretending and they don't believe that. And so race and compounded with, psych with the intersection of race and psychiatric disability makes interactions with police officers more lethal is my point. So I wanna thank you, um, um, uh, Representative Christie for 
making me make that point because I, I, I should have made it sooner, but I haven't because we live in Vermont. Um, but I think it's important for you to know. Great, thank you. I'm not, not seeing any other hands. Thank you so, so much. This was incredibly helpful. Uh, I'm sure we'll have you back if, if you're available, but to continue this conversation and to continue help us um, work work through this. Really, really appreciate your, your time. Great, thank, thank you. you. And, I, and yeah. I really appreciate the work you've done on this bill um, because it's it's considerably better. And I want you to I want you to know that I see that and I appreciate that. Great, well, thank you, appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, again, committee, I know this is a long time, but I, it's a, I think this is a really important flow that I wanna continue with. And um, so, Bo Yang, please. Great, welcome, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for all for having me here today. Bor Yang for the record, um, and the executive director of the Vermont Human Rights Commission. And first, before I say anything about the bill, I just wanna say that while I am a member of the BIPOC community and my personal experiences have informed my work and my commitment to eradicating discrimination, I'm here today only on behalf of myself and on behalf of the agency that I represent, which is the Human Rights Commission. I'm also an attorney, and so I'm viewing this bill with that lens. Uh, and as many of you know, the Human Rights Commission is charged with enforcing the anti-discrimination statutes of the state. This includes the Fair Housing and Public Accommodation Statute, and public accommodations includes roads, hospitals, schools, and of course, law enforcement entities. So I see this bill as um, a small, a positive move forward and having a clear and well articulated standard on use of force in our statutes serves as a tool for lawyers such as myself and judges to review police brutality cases. Um, I really appreciated hearing Wilda's testimony. I certainly think that what we're trying to do here is change those implicit biases and change culture and change those social norms. And we try to get at that at different ways, right? Training, policy changes, laws, uh, but no one thing actually changes social norms. But having said that, I, I do, I am a big believer that social norms can be changed. We do see that, we've seen that. And we've seen laws really change that as well. So I am grateful for this bill and I would uh, encourage you to move forward with it. Um, I thought that it might be helpful to kind of clarify how a discrimination case can be proven under our public accommodations laws right now. So in order for someone to prove that they have been discriminated by the police, uh, they either have to show that they have been harassed and the standard for harassment is severe or pervasive, which is very difficult and impossible to prove. The other way is to show that they have been treated differently or denied services or benefits. Uh, whatever services and benefits that are generally available to the public were not made available to them. They have to show that they were a member of protected class, they were denied those benefits and services, that that denial was because of their membership in a protected class, and um, there cannot exist any legitimate non-discriminatory reason for that denial, or the complainant and plaintiff has to prove that those legitimate non-discriminatory reasons that are raised by the police are pretextual in nature. So basically they're not the real reason. The hardest elements to prove always is that something happened because of someone's race, color, national origin, or disability, and two, overcoming the legitimate non-discriminatory reason that can almost always be articulated by the police after the fact. Okay. Uh, so how do you prove that something happened because of someone's protected status? Well, you can prove it with direct evidence, such as an officer yelling a racial slur while conducting the forceful arrest. But even then, we have a lot of courts that have said, well, maybe that racial slur was just yelled because they were angry and that wasn't the true motivating factor for the action. So you have a, a court system too that is looking at the same things 
that maybe objectively members of the community would look at and go, wow, that sounded really racist. But of course it says, well, that wasn't, while the racial slur was uttered, it wasn't really the motivating factor for holding someone too long or arresting someone forcefully or denying them a phone call when they should have been given that phone call. So, and by the way, direct evidence is rarely available, okay? Um, we almost never get it. And even if it happens, we never get a recording of it or evidence of it. So what do you do when you don't have direct evidence? You gotta find a comparator. You have to find someone else who is similarly situated, who was treated differently, maybe better. And again, that is nearly impossible. We know, that the police treat people differently on the basis of race and color and disability and other protected categories. We have statistics across the country and traffic data here that tell us that. We have hundreds and thousands of stories really from BIPOC people about this. And uh, more so than ever, we're seeing videos of police shooting unarmed black men and women, but peacefully arresting white terrorists with weapons and firearms in their hands. But statistics and videos of different officers using force does not win a discrimination case. It is not the kind of evidence that courts even uh, admit and allow. Um, at the Human Rights Commission, we're sometimes going on a fishing expedition to really comb through hundreds and thousands of arrests to see, one, if they're available in the first place, and then if they are, to see if the same officer treated people differently and what were the different circumstances. And I would just tell you that that makes our job really impossible. It makes it really difficult. Um, the law, the standards, the process is stacked against us. One thing that would be helpful for us is for the police to do this work, to do this comparison themselves. Every time an officer uses force to have the supervisors who are charged in charge of those officers to do that kind of comparison. Now, I, I get it, they have implicit bias and they may not do a fair comparison, but at least we're tasking them with gathering the data and collecting that information so that when the Human Rights Commission has to review these cases, we can say, show us the comparison that you have done and give us those videos um, and give us that analysis. And that allows us to do our jobs better. So my wish, I think, for this bill would sort of put some responsibility on the police to review every use of force uh, and do an analysis and, and, and do that. My only other suggestion on the bill is on page three, starting at line one, it's, the, it's part of the definition of totality of the circumstances and under subsection E, it reads, factors such as the age, size, and relative strength of the officer and the subject, comma, the skill level and training of the officer, comma, and whether the officer or the subject is injured or exhausted. I would recommend deleting the skill level and training of the officer. I think that every police officer, regardless of years of experience, should be held to the same standard for use of force. Uh, we cannot excuse excessive use of force because of that offers lack of experience. In the same way, if you're going to conduct neurosurgery, you have to be competent, and it doesn't matter if this is your first surgery. I think the same is true for officers. So uh, that's all I have. I'm happy to answer any questions, but want to save some time for my uh, friend and colleague, Kaya Morris, too. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate your testimony, and um, but I do want to make sure that, that that we do get to to folks' questions and and um, and spend the time we, we need with you as well. Uh, Martin, I see your hand is up. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you very much, Barbara. That's uh, helpful. Um, so I wonder if you have any uh, if you have anything fleshed out as far as that concept of re uh, review uh, that you could send along uh, that I could. Uh, perhaps work on and, and consider whether we can put that in. Absolutely. Yeah, I can send that to you. Uh, thanks. Not seeing, again, I'm not seeing any hands, but I just want to give people time. Nope. Okay. 
Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, Kaya Morris, welcome. Welcome. Thank you. thank you very much for having me this morning, everyone. I hope you all are doing well. And thank you so much for the previous witnesses. Fantastic conversation, such important insights. Um, I think what is really, really powerful um, on from both um, Bohr and from Wilda's testimonies were around thinking that we need to continue to fine tune this work. Um, there are so many positive improvements, I feel, to this from this amendment, from where it previously was to where we are today, that I feel great hope within this. Um, and it does make me have greater confidence in the ability to take some of this on from a legal standpoint. Um, one of the things that I did appreciate within this was the duty to warn the use of deadly force. Um, again, so it one of the, I think something that's gonna be key is to ensure that what's happening in S-124 is enforceable in this one and vice versa. So some of the pieces around police behavior, even around the goading, those sorts of things that falls more into what 124 is trying to do, but you should be using the same standards and definitions across both. And that might be helpful um, as well as you can inform that bill um, in certain places. So, you know, if they are doing what they're supposed to be doing, and if they are using body cameras as they're supposed to be, then you will have that evidence of that duty to warn that was um, required in this bill. If they don't, then it doesn't matter. <laughs> but if we're able to um, ensure that some of the standards and protocols that are put in place through 124 are actually implemented, and I, you know, that's a whole separate commentary that I have to have around that one. That's not necessarily for this particular bill. Um, so I think that that's really important. I think the definitions of force are also really helpful. Um, I'm always uneasy with totality of circumstances kind of sections. I always feel like we still have too much discretion that's able to be used um, in determining those different standards. So I, I'm appreciative of the fact that you all are trying to dig deeper around whether or not you keep it as a shall, must, may, whatever that particular language is. Um, because even if I, as an individual who may not have a mental health crisis happening, I should have protection under the law, that actually should be equal, right? So because we also have so many different spaces where we can see that uh, the determination of a crime being committed it's completely up to that officer's determination for them to create probable cause to start engaging. And that when that happens to folks who aren't in mental health crises, it still ends in violence. Okay, so we have to think a little bit more deeply, I think, around that. Um, the, the suspicions themselves are suspect. And as many have talked about, it's around implicit bias in many instances. Sometimes it's just outright racism. Sometimes it's just outright, you know, just modes of supremacy and power and control. Um, and so there, we, we want to keep a close eye on that. Um, I would love to have more clarification. I think it's through that clarification that we close the gaps between that broad discretion that's able to be used to determine if they're checking off those boxes and what we're currently struggling with right now if there is a possibility, that might not be. Um, and that again is still a greater discussion around how we're thinking about defunding or um, you know, divesting from police to do different approaches other than standard policing to respond to a variety of societal in, um, encounters. So um, the, the, I, I appreciated Rep Representative Donahue's comments with regards to goading that are within, that are not really there within the bill. Again, I think that might fall into 124. Um, I think that that is not something that we do wanna dismiss because it is, um, as mentioned, a potential tactic. So um, this, is, this is moving in the right direction and in a time when people are getting attacked on the streets for trying to find ways to raise attention to this. And I know it's not easy. And I know you have some very tense um, negotiations that you're trying to make with the entities that may not have an invested interest in changing some of these standards. Um, I did wanna, you know, again, um, I, I appreciate where um, what Bohr was mentioning around, you know, wanting to find a way to hold the police departments themselves accountable. And again, 
I don't know if this committee feels like they need to stay in their lane, but if we're going to talk about 124, I think that that's a place to provide comments on that because I don't have any reason. There's no reason that the public has, that members of the public have to trust that that process will be fair. And as you know, I think that she was very clearly saying in this moment, um, in this moment, this is who we are working with are law enforcement entities that don't necessarily have a vested interest in wanting to do real meaningful investigations into their own people as far as their actions are concerned. So um, I still worry about that malfeasance that will take place. So um, that that doesn't, you know, that doesn't give me the greater assurances that they are going to do that, but we do need to get some systems in place. So um, for for so on its face, what we have here in the bill, I think is a drastic improvement from where we were. And I'm really grateful for all the testimony that this committee has taken from members of the public and the community on trying to get this to where it needs to be and absolutely more than happy to be here for future conversations as well. Thank you. So appreciate hearing from you. Thank you. And, and this is an ongo ongoing conversation for, for sure. Uh, Martin. Thanks a lot, uh, Kai. And uh, I still miss seeing you across the table. So it's nice to see you across the virtual table today. Um, I just had, uh, I wanted to flag one thing and, and actually would like your input and, and perhaps will this because we didn't really touch on this. Uh, you're talking about deference and there's a lot of discretion still in the totality of circumstances, but I'd like to point you uh, to uh, page four and, and paragraph seven, which the intent there, and this is where I'd like any uh, board could comment too, if she, I guess she's not on still. The intent there is actually that that is a, essentially a de-escalation and that is actually uh, putting an obligation where mm -hmm. feasible for there to be de-escalation, which mm -hmm. I think that, you know, that is one of the areas where I think we are uh, not necessarily narrowing the discretion, but or deference, but pointing it that you, this is something you have to do and we're going to put it in the standard. And if you don't mm -hmm. do it where it's feasible, uh, you're potentially liable. Uh, and I don't know if you have a comment on that or if Wilda wants to comment, comment. If that's, if I'm seeing it the right way, if that's clear enough that that's kind of the intent uh, there. Um, again, I think that the intent came clear. Um, it's the implementation. And so again, not wanting to blend the two bills. I think that, I think that this gives us a, a touch point to start that conversation to then go back and do the deeper dive. Um, yeah, I think the use of force policy that uh, needs to be done and made uniform across the state that fleshes this out, presumably uh, it will follow uh, what we're putting in here in a standard. Uh, I, I, in fact, talked to legislative council about whether we needed to make that explicit. Mm -hmm. uh, and Bryn said, no, that, that's pretty clear that if we have the standard here, if they're working as I understand the Vermont uh, criminal just criminal justice training council, I think I got that right, is in fact working on a policy and presumably they'll follow this and maybe flesh out that de-escalation part a little bit. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Anyway, yeah, no, I appreciate for sure. That. No, oh, absolutely, boy. absolutely. I mean, I, th I think, and I think what I'm speaking to as well is when we're talking about the totality of circumstances is something that we're <coughs> looking at after something has occurred, right? And so still going back to what Wilda was saying earlier around the prevent the preventative components of this, where are the com com preventative components that that discretion, we need that level of discretion before the encounter begins. And that is so variable that that's where it feels, it still feels a little um, out of touch. Um, well, and that's not even the right words that I'm seeking to use, but it, it feels distant from, I think, what um, a member of the public would need to um, have greater assurances around that, if that makes sense. And so whether or not that's here or if that's somewhere else, um, that's just something that I wanted to bring forth. So, um, yeah. So I appreciate that. So again, because yes, that that sort of like fact finding of like what did happen if we're looking at the totality of the circumstances, like there it's so contingent on everything that happened before that encounter actually began. So when there was the decision that that gentleman, that black gentleman with autism sitting in front of the fire station was potentially causing a crime of loitering and that begins a whole escalating encounter like that you know that the, the 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 touch points that we can touch we absolutely should and then um where we can't it needs to be picked up in other pieces of legislation but as long as they're also sinking so i think i think it's going to be important to make sure that your definitions here are lining up with what's going to happen in 124. right thank you 
And I don't know if Will did, had any further input on that other issue that I neglected to mention earlier and that Kaya kind of brought to mind. Yeah, I, I'm glad you, um, you, you raised that because I, I actually um, was quite heartened by that provision in the statute because so seldom have you written statutes that have the word shall. <laughs> so, right. I thought, you know, and I think it's, I, I actually think it's a really strong, positive, probably first in the nation type uh, provision in a use of force statute where you're telling people, hey, you need to try to deescalate because this is what I've really wanted from the legislature to actually put a stake in the ground and you say what this community wants to see. And I feel like you do that in this subsection. You're saying what this Vermont community wants to see is you do these things before. You're not leaving it to the cop's discretion. You're saying as a community, Vermonters think that before you use force, you should do these things. And I think that is great. I really do. I really applaud actually um, your, your including that uh, in such language um, and putting in, you know, even the parenthetical, if feasible, doesn't require, doesn't cause me to, you know, be less uh, happy about it because uh, I've never seen it before, actually, and I appreciate it. Now, having said that, I do know that, you know, all of this stuff uh, that was in Burlington's um, policy as well, and, and they didn't do it, but I still nonetheless think that, um, that that's something that you know community activists can 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 use, um, and um, I, I think it's great actually. And I, I would I, I hope that makes it through um, to the end <laughs> after after, the, after you know all the stakeholders weigh in. You know I can see that being eliminated or that shell becoming a may. But you know that you put it in, I'm giving you some um, props. Well, we'll fight for it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Really, really helpful. Thank you. Um, not seeing any other hands, but Kaya, thank you. And always so, so wonderful to, to see you. And, and thank you, everybody. Thank you, committee, for hanging in here. Um, I did want to mention that um, we do have testimony from Laura Ziegler and um, Michael Saborn, I hope I'm saying his name correctly, but they are um, mental health advocates and Lori has posted them. So as I've reached out to people, some people are um, are sending written testimony and, and, and not uh, joining us on Zoom. Um, however, that testimony is very important and want to make sure that um, uh, that folks see it and um, and Lori, remind me if I don't mention it <laughs> and uh, something's posted, please, uh, please help me remember to, to point it out to folks.